I will start by saying that the current juncture of what we are talking about, both as emergency and the kind of violence that we are seeing in public space, is something that we need to contextualize. That what does it really mean? Is it some goons wreaking havoc in our public space? Is it that a certain kind of behavior has come in the forefront because of social media? You know, it's always easy to blame technology for what is happening because it's new, something which is new must therefore also be related to what is new in technology. Or is it something deeper we are experiencing in our society? And I would start by saying that if we don't understand the nature of public violence today, then we would not understand also what the objective of this violence is. That it is not, it is that it is just political forces which have always believed in strong arm methods getting stronger temporarily and so on. But there is a design which is larger that we need to understand. And the design is not just a simple political design, but it is really a design at the level of societal reconfiguration. Now, why this is so, for doing that, I'm going to take you a little afar. I'm going to take you to the United States, where lynching as public spectacle became quite known, may not be known to us, but certainly as a public spectacle, it was quite well known. And uh, recently, last 10, 15 years, a lot of material has come out which has documented the nature of this violence and how it was actually transmitted, shown, and how people participated. And both these elements are important because at that time as well, there were technological innovations of a certain kind in society, which is the camera. So you have photographs of lynching, which were taken, sold, and what is even more horrifying, transmitted as postcards. Actually, they were printed as postcards and circulated all around. And banal messages written in the back of it, oh, you know, this happened, you can see me here. And a circle is drawn around the person's face. Or, yeah, we caught him and we burnt him. Things like this, along with how are you, do write back to me and things like that. So very much in the genre of what is social media today, we have the postcards and the camera performing the role of cell phones and Facebook. So this is what also made me think about that it is not the social media which is driving what's happening today. The mode of transmission or the mode of communication is not what is the central message of what is happening, but it is something else. And we need to really think about that if we want to resist it, combat it, and defeat it. So I will start with things which perhaps we would not have seen so easily, which is essentially bodies hanging from trees. These were black, that time called Negroes, being hung as a part of lynching. So you have this very powerful poem, which was sung by a number of artists. Southern trees bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Now this is evocative because this was the image which at that time was replicated across postcards. So this is what I really want to bring out. As you can see, somebody has taken a photograph and has written on that something which indicates what he or she thinks is important for being present here. This is the postcards of the thing of, of, of a similar kind. This on the left is a postcard of a lynching in Dallas. Dallas had at that time a population of 92,000 people. 
5,000 people participated in this lynch. 5,000 of a population of 92,000. It's mass participation. And that is the significant point that you have to think about. Why did it have this mass participation? What were the people participating in? And again, there is a postcard. And the postcard is again saying, oh, you haven't written to me for some time. Please do write to me, and so on. The other photograph that you can see on the right, and this was a photograph, which again is documented, available now in various books. Uh, this is, if you see closely, you will see the people have come well dressed. They have ties, coats, normal. They're talking to each other, pointing at each other and taking photographs. This is normalcy for them. And this is again mass participation of a different kind. This is your not mob. This is middle class gentry coming out to mark their presence in an event which people have been lynched. Now, this is the other part of it, that they were lynching places in towns. That's where lynching would take place. People would not only take <coughs> photographs, they would also take souvenirs, something from the body strand of hair. So this was par for the course. And in the record of families, these are found routinely, that there is this memorabilia that the family collected, had photographs and strands of hair, some something else. It's difficult to go through all of these accounts without really feeling, feeling sick about how Human nature can be perverted, except for the fact that we are seeing it almost every day around us. So we cannot, in that sense, feel a sense of distance. Oh, that happened there, They're really bad. We are not like that. When lynchings took place, it was a public event. Schools, businesses closed, trains, buses ran, newspapers announced it. So it was always a public spectacle. The lynching was not only well organized, it wasn't quite often spontaneous. It was planned and with the full connivance of everybody, including obviously the police and the local authorities, that the lynching was conducted. Now what is, I, I would like to move from the background of all this, and this is uh, not something which is which is easy to understand. Uh, what was the, why was this being done? Was it just random violence? Was it a sense, okay, certain acts are so bad that you had to lynch people? So it's very clear. <coughs> Lynching was directed largely at the black population. It wasn't directed it at just anybody. It was directed at the black population. And it was directed <coughs> largely to the, uh, at the men. Of course, the Hispanics were killed, some whites were killed, and also black women were also lynched. Let's not think that it was just the black men. They came to get the husband or the son, didn't find them, lynched the wife or the mother. So that, that was there. But the directed, really, direction was or, or the, at the black men. What was the backdrop of this? This is the period which happens, this is the period of 1877 to 1950. People have said, some have said 1967 to 1960, 1867 to 1960. If we leave the rough, rough dates out, it doesn't really matter. The broad message is it came post the Civil War. Why was this important post-Civil War? Because slavery had been abolished. So this lynching that we talk about did not happen automatically as a part of normal social events, as it were, something which is an aberration, which society sometimes did. It was a systematic attempt 
to reconfigure the racial society, particularly of the South, which had under force been, had abolished slavery. It was what the Civil War was about. Slavery was abolished. The South did not agree to slavery being abolished. That's why the secession and the Civil War. So the response of the South was the response of lynching to re-establish the racial configuration that existed before that, which was slavery. <clears throat> so this is, again, a postcard printed by a pharmaceutical company, a drug company, and this was quite a well-known poem, apparently, which I wasn't aware of. <clears throat> so this is, this is the only branch of the dogwood tree, an emblem of white supremacy. Lessons once taught in the pioneer school, that the land of white man's rule, that red man once in an early day was told by the whites to mend his way. The Negro now, by eternal grace, grace, must learn to stay in the Negro's place. In the sunny south, the land of the free, let the white supreme forever be. Let this a warning to all Negroes be, or they will suffer the fate of the dogwood tree. So, clear message that it is a message to the Negroes. Don't get beyond your slave state. You might have been freed legally, but you have no rights. And this is what is being reconfigured post the Civil War through lynching. And that is why the lynching and the public spectacle go hand in hand. It's the participation of the white majority, A, in trying to get back the Negroes to their place, and also telling the Negroes, African Americans today, that you have no rights. You might have been freed. We have been forced by the North, the federal government, to declare that you are not slaves. But nevertheless, you have no rights. There is no law for you. Wherever we want, we can do whatever we want to you. This is the message that this represents. Now the question is, this is, what did it really do? If you see the post-Civil War, we slowly see the pushing back of slavery, different rights being established, okay. But what do we see? We see segregation. So, white violence, lynching and mass violence that we were talking about, the public spectacle was to establish the new boundary of segregation, which, because of earlier slavery, might have been de facto there, but there was no legal segregation. So you get segregated schools, you get segregated spaces. All of this is to re reconfigure the racial divide, now not through slavery, but through segregation. And this is what you see in the U.S., that segregation becomes a norm. Even when it is a norm, when the segregation is not there in education, schools, or in public places, there is segregation in the way you live. <coughs> Blacks lived different, in different spaces, whites lived in different spaces, and the common argument would be if a black comes into a white community, <coughs> property prices drop, and therefore, you don't really want mixed localities. <laughs> but racism, the reconfiguration of racism in the South, in the American South, does not stay in the South. It also comes to the North, but in more insidious ways, not in such blatant ways through legal segregation, which is what the U.S. Supreme Court's judgment was. What is it? Equal but separate. That was a segregation basis equal but separate. And if you remember South Africa, it was also the same argument apartheid had as a slogan. We are equal but separate, apart from the fact we have 90% of the land and 90% of the money, but that apart. Now, if you see today the civil, civil rights movement in the United States 
actually came out of the anti-lynching violence. It came out of segregation. All that combined to create what we now know about is the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King, etc. Now, post desegregation, which of course was bitterly resisted in the South, as you know, the US South, what has happened today? And it's interesting to see how race has reconfigured itself anew after desegregation or after civil rights movement established certain basic rights that today more blacks have died in police violence in the United States in the year 2015, for example, than did through lynching in the entire period of 1877 to 1951 year. That one in three youth will go to jail once in their lives if you are a black. And 2.3 million people are in US prisons who are black. That's a significant part of the African-American men. And that's a significant part. Is directed much more at the men. Because men, they believe, can resist, and therefore they are violent, and therefore the need to discipline them. And if they put up any resistance, they shoot to kill. So this is the position that we have in the United States. I've been giving this as a background to show that whether it is lynching as a public spectacle or it is police violence today, it's really the reconfiguration of racial boundaries that at each time have been challenged. Challenged in the Civil War, slave, slavery being abolished, challenged segregation being abolished, and each time it has reconfigured itself to a different kind of violence, but it has reconfigured itself. And that's the lesson that I want you to think about, that public violence is not just simply <coughs> violence which is of a mob, which is of riots. Public violence, which is a spectacle of this kind, with mass participation, is actually an attempt to reconfigure society in a particular way. And it is generally a response to certain rights that have been won, that have to be quote unquote won back or put back by the dominant community. So it's not simply a story that if you struggle, you get oppressed. That we understand. Struggle, fight, that's clear. But this is actually when you win the fight, you get a new danger. And the new danger then is manifest itself in different ways. And this is what I am taking the southern example, the southern United States to be, that there is an objective behind the mass violence. Public spectacles which have this kind of participation that we are seeing today has an objective which is not just mindless violence. When it is celebrated through videos, transmitted in WhatsApp and on Facebook in different ways. There is an objective that is there, and that's what we need to really look at. <clears throat> now, I'm getting, because it's Janata Manch, uh, therefore I'm getting a little cultured, so I'm reading poetry today, which I normally don't do. So there is the killing the Shambukas, this is drawing its reference really from the strange fruit, that poem that we talked about. This is when Rohit Vimula was killed. Then Chandra Mohan wrote a poem, ceiling fans bear a strange fruit, blood on the books, blood on papers, a black body swinging in mute silence, strange fruit hanging from trident. Now, this is the connection that I would like to make, that when today you have lynching as a spectacle, and of course we see lynching is not only a spectacle, lynching is being videoed, you have people standing around, people participating in the violence, you have the complicity of the crowd who then claim nothing, they saw nothing, they heard nothing, that it really didn't happen this way, it was actually a small incident, it's just unfortunate somebody died, 
when all this manufacture shall we say evidence is created and quite often the victims are the ones against whom cases are lodged this is also the other part of the story that the cases are against the victims families they are the ones who are supposed to have been instigating the violence or they were cattle thieves on the other hand those who are convicted are being garlanded by ministers there is this public acceptance that this is great deed you have done you are fighting for something great so all this that you see is trying to also give a message what is the message and i would argue that what you are seeing is is actually the what the national movement had established in the country a secular state which had obligation that it would not only protect minorities but also provide affirmative action which is what we call reservation now this two elements that the state has responsibility for a secular country that the people have to protect the secularism of the country and that we who have oppressed dalits for thousands of years we have the moral and the physical responsibility of providing a safe space and a space which can provide them with education health and other benefits which a middle class takes for granted the affirmative action that the state had promised in different ways this is the gain of the national movement what was the national movement all about it was to the british are outsiders we want our independent economic space and the promise of the independence movement was that all the people would benefit that the peasantry the main part of the movement <coughs> the working people all of them would benefit it will be a place which will have in that sense no discrimination against any section of course discrimination was there in society and we know it discrimination against castes discrimination against women they're all embedded in society but the constitution we did that at that time that was finally accepted also accepted that this discrimination would be removed would not exist and the state has a responsibility for it and my argument is that it is against the constitutional provisions which came out of the national struggle that the right wing at the moment is creating the lynch mob and the lynch mentality as a way of disenfranchising a section of the people so it is in that sense like in the united states the push back came that if you make the slaves free will push back to lynch after 60 years of the national movement memory having faded after dismissing whatever we gained of, out of the national movement as something which is quote unquote nehruvian and not apparently patelian we now are entering a phase that we the, the sex, certain sections not we but certain sections would like to roll back history and rolling back history for them is first disenfranchising the muslims and then the second which is taking away reservation the reservation taking away may take a little more time it's not that simple today because if you don't disenfranchise the muslims first if the muslims dalit and others get together then you have a problem so what do you do turn the gun turn violence towards the muslims and try to rally the rest this was the gujarat progress the gujarat what is called riots now riots are to me would seem to indicate that both sides participated these are not riots there were complicity complicity of the state in terms of mass violence against the minorities against the muslims that's what gujarat was seen gujarat had seen creeping communal communal riots and i'm using this riots in a again wrongly 
creeping communal violence in Ahmedabad, in Gujarat, across other towns of Gujarat as well, this creeping violence, what it created was ghettoization of the Muslims over a period. I used to see this in Ahmedabad and Baroda. I used to go to Baroda at the time because as an engineer, I was working in some project with the Gujarat State Electricity Board. And when used to go, every time I would find a curfew in some part of Ahmedabad and in some part of, Guj or some part of Baroda. These are not big communal conflagrations. They were limited violence, but it was always there. So this limited continuous violence was configuring the towns into what is today called in Hindustan and Pakistan, India and Pakistan in Ahmedabad and Baroda. In fact, you can't take an auto from a Hindu area to a Muslim area and vice versa because you have to change autos at the border. That's the way Abhidabad has been reconfigured. That's the way Baroda has been reconfigured. Now, this, this was a continuous process, but it culminates in the riots, the Gujarat riots, Gujarat communal carnage, whatever you want to call it, that this makes clear to the Muslim minorities that you no longer have rights in Gujarat. You cannot vote in Gujarat. If you vote against us, we'll punish you again. So we see the message what, what the lynching as a public, as public spectacle was doing in the, in the United States, in the South, is the same logic that is operating here. And we did do see that Gujarat Muslims have been disenfranchised in a very fundamental way, even the main opposition party in Gujarat, the Congress, will not put up Congress candid Muslim candidates, will not seek directly the vote of the Muslims, will not put Muslim leaders to speak on its platform. You can see, therefore, the disenfranchising of the Muslims taking place in different ways. And the worst of all, well-meaning liberal Muslim friends who take to platform saying Muslims at this point must not speak for themselves. They must not put up candidates. They must actually rally behind secular, secular parties. Secular parties is not the issue, but they should not voice their, their, their opinions. They should stay silent. Now that's the ultimate, when the community decides to keep its voice, lose its voice, and disenfranchise itself. And that is the message of the kind of public violence we are seeing today. So I would argue that there are two objectives to what we are seeing in terms of lynching and violence. It's also not that it is only reflected to Muslims. When you talk about, for instance, the death row people, <coughs> largely Dalits and Muslims, almost 75 to 80 percent of Dalits and Muslims, probably the figures are even higher. This is Una, this is Gujarat riots, we all are familiar with the images. Now, what does it actually mean? Let's look at what some of us have tried to set up. It's called Hate Crime Watch. Now, we are trying right now to get some figures in terms of what is available in the English papers and we try to put something together, what is called hate crime between 2009 and 2018. The numbers are smaller, mainly because we don't, we have not tapped into the regional press. It's really what, quote, unquote, what's called the national press is printing. But the figure is very clear that large part of it is directed against Muslims and then against the Christians. The figures are very, very clear. And the perpetrators are again very clear who they are. And what are the causes are also very clear. It's either eating cow or across religious boundaries, marriage, or what is called conversion. All of these leads to a certain kind of violence. So very clear hate crime violence that we are at the moment we can document. Now, my purpose of all this is not to say that, you know, this is what's happening and give a scientific, quote-unquote, scientific explanation of what's going on. But the real issue is 
How do you resist it? So the first sign of resistance is for us to understand, which I think most of us do, that if we don't stand up today for others, we'll obviously not be able to stand up when they come for me, when they come for you. So that, I think, message most of us have. But I think the real message that we have to have is not what happens when there is violence. I do agree. When there is violence which is directed against a certain community, community against certain people, it's very difficult to be there at the spot. We can't because it's happening in a very, very distributed way. And the enemy has the ability to mobilize, shall we say, attacks at any point. So you cannot therefore have a boundary which you can defend. The boundary is everywhere. So that's not going to happen. But what is it that we can do? And I would argue that we need to provide defense of what of the victims. We need to rally to the defense of the victims, both in terms of support and in terms of legal defense. I think what, what we don't seem to understand is that not only are the victims today have to suffer the consequence of the violence, they are the ones who are being taken to courts. They are the ones who have to go from court to court seeking for bail, fighting the case, and it can go on for two years, three years, four years, five years. This is the legal system. And if we do not provide a structure of support to them, what we are going to do is to, of course, raise the counter communal forces and that counter communal forces is to play completely, completely into the hands of the right. The BJP's biggest victory is if they can drive the Muslims all to the Jamaat camp, in which case they have won. So this is the threat that we have today, that the secular forces, those who believe they are secular, if we are not able to come in the support of the victims, if we are not able to build structures, which can provide not only support, but legal defense of the victims. If we are not able to follow up of the cases of those who have been participants, who have been the perpetrators of the violence, if we are not able to do this, then it will be very difficult to save our secular space only by rallying behind certain political parties or casting our vote against them. It's not enough to speak. It's not enough to go and vote. I think the time has come that we have to express our solidarity physically in terms of checking up. Have their fires been filed? Going and asking the police, why have their fires not been filed? Creating a kind of support group which will legally defend those who are being hounded after the violence so that they drop the cases. Must also understand why these counter cases are lodged. So, police will say, you know, people just make up both sides, you just get together. This is also what we saw in Muzaffar Nagar, that's what we saw in Gujarat. You want to come back to the village? Drop your cases. Don't give witness. Surrender. Then you can come back. So, this is the basic message. And I again go back to what was the message of the lynch law. That is the message that was there. That surrender, you stay, but you stay at our suffering. This is the message which we have to contest. And we can contest this today only if we are able to stand beside the victims and fight with them, both legally, socially, and politically. I know it's a hard task. It's a hard task because we had never thought this path would come to this path. This is not what we had organized ourselves for. We had organized ourselves for struggle of the workers, struggle of the peasantry, struggle of the rights of different sections struggle of the rights of the Dalits, communal harmony. This was supposed to be our slogans. We were fighting for a different future. We were not fighting in defense. We were really fighting for what we thought was the future. But unless we can defend the present, we will not be able to advance. And I would therefore ask all of us, including me, that if whatever platform we are in, whatever institution we are in today, how can we do small things which help in creating 
legal defense, social defense, as well as political defense for the communities under attack. If this task we do not do, we will not be able to deal with the larger political task of combating the right. And then the task for the right will be made easier because they will splinter each of us, each of the groups, each of the identities. And identity politics, if once it takes root, if we fight on the basis of our identities, then the majoritarian discourse really wins. And that is the also the part of the right wing offensive to consider ourselves as only as identities. So we consider ourselves Hindus, Muslim, this caste, that caste, and so on. We don't think in terms of class. We do not think who is benefiting out of this current dispensation. Who, with all the things that happened, Mr. Modi's victory, all the globe trotting he did, ultimately Sadanis, Ambanis, so that world hasn't changed. Choksis, that world hasn't changed. It's not a demand that some of our friends make in terms of identity politics, that it's all right if there are capitalists, if there are poor, if there are landless labor, as long as it is equitable among castes. So what you are saying is, if I also get representation in the bourgeoisie, I'm okay. But that's not our battle. So that is the basic problem that we have, that once we splinter in terms of identities and ask for essentially representation, the politics of representation and the politics of emancipation are going to be completely different. So I would also submit that response to this kind of majoritarian violence is, it cannot also be in terms of identities it has to be in terms of getting everybody together and isolate those who want to configure society differently by using public violence.